Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming. My name is uh, Abdul Rashid Hussain. Uh, I work with the USCRI, uh, United States Committee for Refugee and Immigrants uh, Office. And uh, I'm a Somali elder. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today and uh, you know, be with us uh, in this event. So uh, my responsibility will just be to introduce you guys and then introduce uh, our friends here at the panel uh, on the desk. And then uh, once we do the introduction, uh, each one will give a short story of uh, you know, something that will be very relevant to their lives get to know them a little bit uh, and then I will call uh, Lori uh, Stavran who is our colleague put a lot of effort she's going to meet her as well and then she will uh, finally welcome uh, Brad who did the heavy lifting of the whole book so that will be our agenda and then we'll open up uh, for Q&A uh, for anybody who want to ask any questions and they will be, they'll be able to respond. Uh, on the far left, uh, there is uh, Mohammed Abdul Aziz. Uh, Mohammed Abdul Aziz will be interpreting uh, for our sister Fadusa. Uh, Mohammed Abdul Aziz is uh, the son of uh, Fadusa. Uh, he has taken a very big role here in the translation interpretation to make this a success. And then we have Abdi Hamid uh, Muhammad. He is also one of the writers. Uh, and he will also give us a story. And then here is my good friend Shadia Muhammad. Uh, uh, these are all people who came together to make this uh, a success. So, um, with that remarks, I want to acknowledge everybody who have come here uh, to this event, uh, very good friends. Uh, we expected a larger crowd than this, uh, but still we think people are still coming. It's a Sunday, many of our friends are working, uh, and uh, we will accept their apology for those who did not come. So thank you very much again for all of you who came. And again, my name is Abdul Rashid Hussain, and I'll be the Master of Ceremony for today. So, so I'll begin with Mohammed on the far left, uh, just to say a few words, and then you will give to Fadusa and we'll come this way. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Mohammed. Uh, I'm producer son first. And I'm the artist who work uh, in the cover book, and I also worked in the translation with the uh, author. And it's really a great opportunity to work in these stories and so many things to learn from it. So there's not much to say about me, more than just listening to the three stories we have. So we, we go to Fergus and I'll translate for you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, we'll give now the floor to Fadusa Abdul. seven kids and she moved to the United States uh, in 2014 that was almost like about be 10 years uh, yeah and more than that we, we talk about okay 
ったティッシュ、えー、ただウヌがコルスリエマン、ダナウヌゴウチュル、ノロレウハイテイ、ノロイエティエティバダンハクマリエマン。So, I'm here today to share my story from beginning Somali and then moving to Yemen after the war started in Somali and becoming a mother of seven children. And、uh, so many stories, so many challenges went through. I'm here today to share these stories and challenges with you. Why the has it? الموغي إذا إن مكي يرى يا مفتر شو محمد ويجن ويرى تيم بنونة شكاية يري إذا إن قرى فاضي عبد الله كدام عباس سنبوسة شكاية يري أفقوا الحب سنبوس معلنتي مخاي إليه يري ما شاء الله إما مركي لها إيقاضي روماني الإشامي روماني شامبلة ذهروني So,、um, I'm so proud to be here for my children, starting from Mohammed and the back there, Shirhan and Zainab, and everybody else. And I'm proud to be here for, for them and share my story and my thoughts on, on this story. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is Abdi Hamid. My profession. Ah, my name is Hamid. I come to you, hi, hi. I come to, I forget, sorry. I come to United States、uh, 2009. 2009.、Uh, True. Animal, animal, or animal. Come and、uh, go, who want to go to? Sheep. Sheep, yeah. <laughs> so,、uh, Abdi Hamid says that、uh, his、uh, lifestyle back in the country was、uh, he was a、uh, uh, uh, camel and, 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 and、uh, cow and, and And goat farmer. Farming is a little bit different. The way people do over there is a little bit more different from what people do here. Uh, uh, Brad is a, a good farmer, but、uh, it's more or less it's different. So the farming there is people crisscross between three countries. So the Somali geography、uh, is t people who are between three countries. So Somali is a Somali Somali, and then we have Somali Ethiopia, and then we have Somali Kenya. So, that porous land between the three、uh, neighboring countries is where people you know, flock. So, people just follow where the rains are and the pasture is. So, once it rains in Somalia, people will flock over there. When the rains are on the other side of Kenya, they come to the Kenyan side. When it's Ethiopia, they go. So, they are borderless. They just follow where the rain is. So, basically, that's the life of the Hamid g r e w up. ما أنا مالك واحد نعم سيد حولان وقولي قال لك صوت الحين هيو ما أها أنا مالك هسي وأنا مال وان ما في مال بود جناني بس كلامي وبس يقولي إلا حدود بوردر إثيوبيا بوردر كينيا بوردر سوماليا أنت وياي مالك كامل وحقول لي إيمان هي لسا عاوينو تضوى ساعة عاوينو نرشي سوى هذا التاي تضوى ساعة عاوينو يوروبا ويمانيا مركا وحاح المهي وحاي سيعة بهيان عانها جود كهيها ايو ايدها ايو وحاس اللوضة ايو يا عسر مخي كيف الحرونة ايا لكن كامل وحو يمان تضوى ساعة عاوينو So he says uh, uh, being a camel or、uh, uh, A headsman, camels are a little bit different. So, what they do is like the cows and, and the goats, you know, they go during the morning and then they come back in the evening. So, the camels are a little bit different. So, pretty much they are cared for by young men 
they will go during the day and go as far as you can imagine and then they come as late as midnight or sometimes 1 a.m. 2 a.m. in the morning. Marka heaven heaven ni kimi da ani go oh dey li bahiya abe wahan wa aruri ni ni kimi so ata marka ano go aruri ni no ku aruri ni no men heaven lo si da hayo again o sada ani go ni da ata bato marka so he said uh, to, where to get the water uh, is a long distance so it sometimes it takes two days three days just to go and get water and then come back. So he said he was young and uh, late at night they were going to go and take the animals to the water and then he fell asleep. So he said uh, he, he fell asleep and uh, the camels continue, you know, they don't care about who is following them. And then he said after one hour he just woke up and uh, he looked around, the animals were gone and there were a lot of lions in, 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 in that, you know, uh, place. So he was so fearful of the lions, or, or the wild animals, and on the other side, he did not know what to say, that the, the, the camels were lost. So he just started running up and down, and it's very late at night. So he did not know what to do. So he said he ran the fastest he can imagine all his life, uh, just to go get the animals because he did not know where to go, so he was just running all over just to get the, you know, the camels. <laughs> so, so he said one of the saddest moments in his life uh, taking care of the camels he said there was one uh, uh, one of the camels uh, which was his uh, he used to like it uh, but he said some of them are wild uh, and so when he said he was trying to milk um, and then she just got upset and then she kicked him, you know, uh, kicked him so hard. He fell down, woke up, and then he said uh, she caught him by the head and she started, you know, tingling him, you know, in the air like this. His, his legs were right there. So he said life with camels is not very easy, it's very tough. So he says he has a lot of stories, but because of the time he will give to his friend Shadir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.
if I talk about general, Somali Bantu, generally, and Somali Bantu, as every, everyone knows, um, we are Somalis. We live there for a long time, and we are still not recognized as a citizen. And I'm living here in almost 18, 19 years. I'm citizen, my all kids, my kids, they are all citizens. The difference is Somalia um, believe that Somali Bantus are not real Somalis. Um, we never been in the government system. They, what they need us was that they conscript us to 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 make to to make to use us as, as a military purpose to ship us to the war zone. Like 1977, almost 5,000 Somali Bantus died in there. And between uh, the war between Somalia and Ethiopia, and never be never never got a, a higher rank. When the civil war before the civil war, I was a farming. My 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 father had uh, two farms. Uh, we were in a stable situation, even though we were not in the government, but we had. Uh, and we were surviving. We, we, we were just hard working. We, we were working harder, harder, and uh, we were dependent on ourselves. The other Somalis were like, uh, they were in the, system, in the government, government system. They were getting money. They were coming abroad. And none of the Somali banks ever come to U.S., I think, and 20 or 30 years ago. But 1960s, the other Somalis were coming to U.S. for education or for general to, to get more uh, military training or whatever. After the Civil War broke out, we, are, we were in minority in Somalia. We were never had uh, guns or big guns. We thought that when they, they overthrown the dictator, President Mohamed Siad Barre, we thought that the, the, they will establish a government and the gov government will stay the, the way it was. But that never happened. The government totally collapsed. And the country automatically changed to the and tribalism, and people were fighting each other as a tribe. Everyone wants to be a president. So the both majority clans, Awiye and Darod, they share one idea. They don't agree each other. But they share one idea. That idea is Somali Bantu remain the way they are, not to gain to or to be like other Somalis. They share that idea. How we are called as Kakane Darod, means the Darod has a king hair. The Darod called us Kamasle Hawie, means the Hawie has big nose. And we are not both. We are not Hawie, we are not Darod. We are Somali Bantu. Because they want to. to to make a justification to kill us because they don't, they don't come just to you to kill to kill you they say you are Hawaii you 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 related to Hawaii 
That's why the Arab is killing me. Hawiya Kamis, he says, I'm related to, to the Arab. He's killing me. He gave me a name which is called Kakane Darot. The Darot gave me a name which is called Kamafla Hawiya. They both destroyed us. <coughs> they forced us to leave our respective cities and villages. We moved to Kenya. We stay in Kenya for a long time. I appreciate United States Embassy in Nairobi. I applied an, an, an asylum. They approved my case. When I told my history, automatically they approved me. I know the, the guy who was uh, interviewing me, and his name is Charles Flinger. When I told my, my entire story, he cried. He cried. He said, I don't have any other choice except to take you to the United States to, to feel safe. My family and I. So, yeah, my story is very long. Most of my story in the book, if you read the book, you will find out a lot of my story. So I want to conclude here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Shadir, uh, for that emotional uh, story. And I'm sure many other stories will be in the book. So I, I want to invite uh, Mohammed Abdulaziz to talk a little bit about the cover story, uh, the cover uh, of the book. Uh, so maybe he can share with us a little bit. Mohammed. Hello, again. So yeah, I started working with the, uh, the writer Brad here, and uh, I helped him with the translator first. And I translate most of the story of my mother and the story of Abdul Hamid. Then after this, uh, they asked me to do the cover book, and uh, it was really not an easy thing to do because uh, I know the three stories, I know the three people, I know Shatter, I know everyone, and uh, capturing an image match with their stories and what they're saying, it was really difficult to do, but. Uh, after long listening and learning a lot from their stories, I figured out a way to just come with this image you see in the cover. But most likely, I appreciate more the learning from this journey and their stories and what they, they didn't tell in the book, what they said, all of it was interesting. And I didn't, I didn't hear these stories from my mother before. So I was thankful for the, the opportunity of the book, make her talk for a little bit. But she didn't speak before, she didn't tell us anything, she didn't say, maybe because she didn't like mentioning the stories that what she saw before, but I thought it was really important to say it, to tell my siblings to hear everything happened with her, so they learn, and they know that this is a, is a second chance and we have to take it seriously. But most of the stories in the book are really interesting and I learned a lot from it. And this is the most part I, I would like to share that to Look into the story, look to their, what they say and what they've been through. Maybe you will learn something that helps you to come better and be better in life. So, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the floor to Laurie Stavran now to come and say a few words and then invite our writer, Brad. Laurie. Okay. It, it's so wonderful to see you all here. Um, this, this book took years, many, many hours to come together. And it was really inspired. Uh, initially, uh, we started working together, everybody here, uh, supporting Brad as he wrote the novel North. And it became clear that there were 
important stories to learn from. And when you think about how many stories you know from your family, how many stories you wish you knew, and then you think, well, these people have come from a country most of their children have never had the opportunity to be there. They might have been born in a refugee camp. They don't know what happened before. They might have been born in the US. How important is it for them to know the stories of their parents and their people? Um, the other day when Shadir was looking at the book, the finished, the published book for the first time with his children, he was saying, the story is here today and it will be here 200 years from now. And um, so if you're Somali, you know, it's your story and, and hopefully it encourages other people to start sharing their story. And if you're not Somali, it's a way to get to understand more who is in the community and um, much less putting people in a box, much more personal. So the cover you know, that Mohammed made has these three camels, and each of those are a storyteller you know, on their journey. So it's very symbolic that way. I was hoping that maybe Fardusa would say a few more words, because she was very short, so I'm going to embarrass her right now. <laughs> And, and ask if, if uh, she could just say a few more words, and then after that, um, Brad would come up. They all here, they know how to speak English, they, they express themselves, and I wish I can do this for myself, but uh, I'm going to need help here. So, I'm going to be able to do this for myself, and I wish I can do this for myself. My story started uh, being born in Somalia and lived with my family with two other brothers. And I lived with my father. I didn't see much back then, I was young. And most of my challenges started when the war started and we had to uh, move to Yemen. And then from there I became a mother and my life has changed and there starts the really challenges. Muhammad was the first, and when I had him first, uh, everything still was fine, and I liked the motherhood life. Then I had Abdullah come in, and still was like normal, and it's, there's not much happening. And then from Abdulaziz, when is the first uh, son, she, like the third one, and he had disability, this when it started, it started to get hard and challenge. <laughs> so uh, my husband tried to fly out the country for a better opportunity and uh, he got caught and they shipped him back not to Yemen where we at they shipped him back to Somalia 
and we split it there. And then from there, I had to become the mother and the father at the same time. So I had to be the mom at, at home. And then when I send kids to school, I go to work. I start work in the morning, and then I had second job, which is afternoon. So I work the whole day, and then at night, I go back to take care of my kids. If I would say something about the challenges and the hard time I've been through, I, it was hard for me in the beginning, but now I notice that it's something I learned from, and it's something that makes me better today. So, we went through the challenges in Yemen together, and we stayed strong until the war again happened in Yemen in 2010. So, uh, we applied for application uh, in the United States, and our application was approved in 2014. In 2014, they took me and my children to Romania for six uh, months of camp because the U.S. government, they can't go to Yemen, so you have to go to Romania so they can meet you and they review your case. Then from there, in the camp and everything, life starts to change and seeing different perspectives of the world. Romania, I am not sure if you are in the country, but I am not sure if you are so after we meet, we met with the, uh, the United States governments and the people who uh, review your case, they decided to send us to Vermont which is the first time we hear this word, Vermont. It was complete, like, out of belief. And then they thought, like, we thought in that moment that we're gonna go to a bigger city and as we see the United States and the TV. So we were expecting to go somewhere, like, but we saw Vermont and without knowing Vermont, without knowing anything about Vermont, we decided just to take it and go. And I remember the first night when we arrived to here, and the first man we met was uh, Rashid Hussain. <laughs> so, from the beginning, actually leaving Yemen, the people you used to see every day has changed because you flee to a different country, and now we start seeing different people. And she started scared from this time. It's like something she is unusual for her, and she never knew about. And until we arrived to Vermont, this old journey, where we all waiting for people that we know they look like us at the beginning, and just to feel comfortable. But as soon as we arrived to Vermont, the first man was like actually Abu Rashid, which makes it a little bit easier and get a little bit take it easy when you come. And when we saw him, we were like very comfortable to arrive in Vermont. So the first time we arrived actually snowed in Vermont and that was the first time we see snow. We, can't, we couldn't wait until morning and we had to go to check this white thing actually covering up the whole entire area. But we waited until the morning so all of us went outside to play together. And we all got sick together. <laughs> So, uh, the first challenge here, it was, uh, we arrived in the second floor house, and I had a disabled kid, he can walk, and he's on wheelchair, so we had immediately to look for a different house. And then uh, she remembered that day too, she had an appointment at the hospital to start the process to get into the society. 
and then it's supposed to be the translator being there for her to help her with the language, and the translator didn't show up, and that was the first challenge she had. It was like, okay, now uh, this is a new language, and I have to deal with it. So from there, she picked up this as a first challenge and learning a new language. But that was for her, the, uh, for her, it was the third time. She was born in Somalia, her first language, and then she moved to Yemen in a young age. And then she had to learn the Arabic language to survive, and then come into Vermont. It was third language. She's still working on it. It's, uh, it's taking a little bit of time. marka <laughs> After a couple of years, um, I'm glad that people like Rashid Hussain, uh, my friend Lule, other people we met, Lori was from the first people we met in Vermont, and we've been friends since then. She said, I came to Vermont thinking that we only had a small family, but after a few years, it became a big family with a lot of friends. And this is what always I hope for, that just to live in somewhere safe, somewhere where I can educate my children and have better life. And I'm glad that I have now, and this is like the thing I'm, I'm happy for, and this is like the reason I do this, just to share my part of uh, coming from hardship to uh, a good end. Hopefully. <laughs> The stories are a really long story and a lot of things to talk about and you can't take your time. But if you just want to know more about their stories and what happened before in Somalia and what happened in Yemen and along what happened to Vermont, you can find all the stories in the book. Thank you very much, uh, Fadruza, for being brave and uh, sharing all these good stories. Uh, so let me take this opportunity now to welcome our good friend, the writer, who has put a lot of efforts into the book, uh, Brad. Please welcome. Hi. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming and thank the storytellers um, it's been an amazing journey. It's five years that like, we've been working on this pre-COVID. We were going to meet um, in person, and then COVID happened, and so we met on Zoom for for five years, <laughs> and we got to know each other. But mostly, I got to know their story, and um, the stories are incredible. I mean, I'm a fiction writer, so this is you know it, it sort of surpassed anything that a fiction writer could imagine the epic journeys that these three people have gone through and also, you know, the next generation that has gone through because Muhammad, for instance, he grew up in Yemen. He was in Yemen. Um, he's not, you know, so he's learning about Somalia too through hearing these stories. Um, but what's amazing about, I mean, the one thing that's incredible when you read these stories is is just learning about what their lives were like before they they got straddled with that label refugee or asylum seeker that these were people who had whole lives and community and a culture uh, jobs family you know just like you and me uh, and then the terrible thing happened and they um, suddenly have lost their identity as as an individual and so part of telling these stories was a way to regain that personhood um, and um, you know to show others to show people that you know what uh, an asylum seeker is that they there's a whole life that they have before they became that label and uh, i'm just so proud of um, the work we did together and um, 
And I want to thank Lori. I want to thank uh, Onion River Press and Ken McQueen and Riley, who's not here. Um, and, uh, and Muhammad for doing the cover, which is just stunning. I mean, isn't that cover stunning? Yes. <laughs> I mean, because Muhammad revealed shyly. <laughs> Love it. Um, Muhammad, I knew this about Muhammad, and you'll learn this in the book, that he was like a semi-professional soccer player in Yemen, that he, you know, Fardosa had these kids and two with disability, and they were, you know, poor. They had no money. She worked for everything they had. They had, their father was a gun. And, you know, one day Muhammad came home and gave his mother some money. And she's like, how'd you get this? And he said, oh, I'm playing soccer. And most kids in school, like they ask money for, for sneakers, most Yemenis were with like, and he here he comes, he's playing soccer. It didn't make sense. Like, how are you giving, why are you giving me money for playing soccer? Well, he, he was so good that uh, like these private people, the private school found him and um, said you could come to our private school if you play soccer for us. And he was just like the street kid. And, um, and he got this like elite private education uh, that only the rich people in Yemen, Yemen would get. And he was hired on to play for a professional club. And all this was happening in his, so he, he doesn't talk about this in the same way he didn't talk about the fact that he's an artist. And so after meeting him two years into our relationship, he kind of revealed that, oh yeah, he does some art, he plays around. And then he showed me and Donna his work and we're like, he's really good. <laughs> and um, so we asked him if he would do the cover and he asked him. So he's a man of many talents um, and I could go on, but I'm gonna stop. And I wanna thank Donna, my wife, who took the photographs in the book and um, and Lori, of course, for making it all happen. And up of Dirashi Hussain, who is the sort of linchpin of all this. And thank you all for coming. I'm sure I've missed something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brett. Uh, without you, things would have not been possible. So I'll open the floor for Q&A. Uh, if anyone has a question for the panel, will be welcoming and will be able to answer. So the floor is open. Anyone who has a question can, can ask. Miller and uh, 
Linda Miller, they live in North Hero. They are very, very nice family. They hosted me. And then it was uh, December. I never seen snow before. The situation was really difficult for me when I have seen that snow and I, I get a job. I get a bike to go to, to job and to, to where my job is. In the morning I went to, to, to my job and I walk. Even in time when I come back home I get lost. <laughs> and a storm there and a big storm. And it was three o'clock. I was going everywhere, downtown, El Mido Avenue. Three times I came to where I live. I go back. Then I, 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 I have seen all the man. I say, let me ask this guy. I was just, I was speaking a little English. It was very little. I asked him, I am from Africa. I am here only one month. I get lost. I don't know where to go. Can you please help me to treat my home? He said, of course. Where do you live? I say, I live in uh, for the Interval, Interval Avenue. Oh, if you see that light? Next is in uh, you, where you live, for the Interval. It was around uh, 6 o'clock, almost 6 o'clock. Then that was my worst day. <laughs> but otherwise it's good, people were happy. People were helping us, they were bringing clothes, they were just taking us to grocery stores when we need. They were helping us. So, yeah, I, I start forgetting what I have seen before. Yeah, that's the situation I, I am in Vermont, I, the way I like. I never, and a lot of people were calling me and they, they, they were saying, wait, here is it's, it's a lot better than Vermont, come, come here. I say, no, I stay here. I like it. Yeah, I, 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 VRRP helped me to apply a job. That was the first job was just temporary for three months. UVM was cleaning. Then they applied me another job. That job I'm still there. I'm a supervisor now. Yeah, I, I get an experience. They treat me good. Yeah, I like it. I stay there until now. And now I'm, I'm grandfather. <laughs> yeah, five kids. Five, and I have five and grandkids. Yeah, I'm Vermont now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, people are very generous 
And he said all the people he has met uh, are very kind and you know, loving. So he said he's not thinking of moving to another state. He, he will stay here forever. <laughs> أنا وريرة هي أو أنا وريرة هي أو أحمد وردتي هذا واقف حيوان في عراضي وما ما شاء الله غير موضوع شعر عاد ما هو شعر. so he he said he came sick when he came to Vermont and he said uh, he loves the weather so much uh, and he said he got a lot of care especially the medical team so they were able to you know give him a good medication and now he says he's very healthy so he likes how he states he so generous when it comes to compared to other things. Yeah, so he says that he lived in Kakumar, uh, in the refugee camp, where life, life was very tough. And he said they did not have good medical care. Uh, he had a lot of injuries back from uh, the country. And he did not good, get good medical care. But when he came to the US, he got a lot of good care, especially the medical. Uh, and he says uh, this has been the best place uh, when it comes to human life. Uh, people are so much uh, very helpful when it comes to you know, helping people. So he said, when I compare where I came from and where I am today, if I would have stayed where I was, maybe I would have been dead. But today, God, uh, thank to God, He is alive. Rohi and Tatka, thank you for him. And I said it to him. Ilahi, thank you, Matahari. Wahalehi, Mahasidi. Mahasidi. So he says, uh, if, if you don't thank enough the people who help you, you will never be thankful to your God. So you must be thankful to the people first who help you and then you can be thankful to your God. Yeah, and, and that has really inspired him to come forward and, and, and write a book, write his story, and he says he expects many other people will come forward and to give their stories. How uh, <laughs> he says he's very happy. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. all people. Yes, Mr. Green. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, I admire your resilience tremendously. I want to ask you a little bit about um, loss, though, because um, as much as things were hard where you were, um, when people speak your language and when people share the same customs, sometimes it's hard to come to a place that's really different. So I'm wondering what has, what's the thing you miss the most and what's the thing that's been hardest to adjust to? Good question. So she actually went to head away and Makati Tim Martin Mahad Miss Carissa would the kill at Queen Jetan in Tatoisen and how the information and Castor at Sector of Kofi and that he had Miss Carissa would the kill. Uh, 
Because you grew up in Somalia when there was civil war, uh, and uh, especially for women, it was very tough. Uh, and parents were very uh, fearful of their daughters and, and wives, you know, to be raped. So she, she, that's how she grew up. And coming to the United States, you know, so peaceful and people are so much respected. She, she, she doesn't feel so much that she has missed back home, other than, you know, the, the weather maybe.
So that's what they did, and, and then his friend collected some woods, and then they started to make you know these commotions, uh, pretending that he also had a gun. So this lady went there and said, whispered to them, and she said, these guys are loaded, they also have a gun, so if you fight, we, we, can, we can die in between. So the guys were fearful, and they ran away. So that was the only way you know, they could escape. And then they left. As they came, they went along, they said during the, uh, on their way, there were another militia on the other side, and then there were lions on the other side. So they had to choose between the militia and where the lions were. And they, he said, we chose the lions instead. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to go to the lion side because he, he said, because he, he, know, he knows uh, traveling at night, uh, it was easier for him to face the lions than the human being with a gun. So that's how he went and, and you know, he was able to chase the lions and then went his own way. I left you all that cannot know what I why the child I that can Shakari or Fish Fuji office. Where's Arkaya? Why was the child I thank you? So, so Abdi Hamid is saying he, he never had a, a citizenship where he lived because he was crisscrossing between three countries and at least he got the U.S. citizen when he came to the U.S. up there why don't, why don't people um kim where do you want people maybe maybe you could have buy the book from kim and then bring it up to them to sign and um thank you all for coming <laughs> 